I'm really blessed to be here before you this morning for week two of our series entitled Layers of Grace because there are layers to the topic of grace. Amen. Grace is like a really good choco flan. Praise God. If you don't know what a choco flan is, get you some. It's a flan that has all this beautiful flan in it, but there's also cake on the bottom. Grace is like a multi-layered cake. But some of us, we play that game with grace. Is it cake? <laughs> is it grace or is it fake? You ever seen that show on Netflix, Is It Cake, where they make these very realistic looking cakes that look like, I don't know why you would want to make a cake that looks like a sneaker, but they do it. And that sometimes we're living in a way that we think is grace, but is it grace? Is it grace? Last week we talked about grace at the base foundation of grace is this unmerited favor that God gives us. It's the, it's the plan of salvation, right? But it's from this lens of he gives us not just grace for our own salvation in the moment to be saved, but he gives us grace to live out our salvation. We talked about grace being a trainer that trains us for various things in our life. And so grace is not just salvation in and of itself because salvation is not an event. It's the power to live out the journey of salvation in our life. Each and every one of us is on a journey of salvation, or you should be at least, right? We live out this grace because God has been good to us. On the basis of his goodness, we're saved. We said last week we are saved for works. We are not saved by works, and it's a result of God's grace. Why? So that nobody can brag, look what I have done for myself. But because we all know that none of us deserve to be here. That's a great place to say amen. It's like when you have enough airline points and you get upgraded to first class. And you know everybody else around you probably brought their ticket. But you're the one who got the free one. That's not like this. <laughs> Nobody brought their ticket. None of us deserve it. None of us should be here. But because of his mercy and his grace, we're here. So as recipients of God's grace, what does that mean for you and for me? And how should we live out our lives in the context of others in relationship to the grace that God has given us? In other words, what should the response from our life be towards other people because we have been recipients of grace? We've been forgiven of everything, and so how should we then deal with others on that ground that we have been redeemed by a God who's forgiven us when we did not deserve it? We find part of this answer in Matthew 18, 21, where Jesus tells a story of grace in motion, as I like to call it, grace in motion. Hear what it is in Matthew 18, 21. It says this, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Mm, everybody got real quiet now. Oh, Lord, one of those sermons. Okay. He says, the response of Jesus, of Peter, as many as seven times? In other words, should I let somebody offend me or sin against me seven times and still forgive them? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Mm. I don't know about this scripture right here. <laughs> Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of, God, of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Now Jesus is telling a parable. He, he dives into this spiritual story, and he's going to give them a, a, a parable for them to understand what he's talking about. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay his master, order him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, 
pay what you owe me. He probably said it a lot worse than that. If he's choking somebody, he probably said, pay what you owe me. We got to read it like it says it, you know. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. He probably felt because he couldn't breathe. I just want to throw that out there. Have patience with me and I will pay you. He repeats the same thing the servant said to the master earlier. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Here's what Jesus said, verse 35, very sobering. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you. If you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I want to talk to you. For a few minutes on this topic entitled, I'm graced to forgive. I'm graced to forgive. Now, in the verses that we just read, Peter is doing Peter things. And he's asking Jesus. uh, If you look at the scripture and you follow the narrative of the gospels, it's always Peter. I mean, Peter gets into a lot of trouble. But Peter, he's being generous. And he says, if someone, he goes, if someone offends me and someone sins against me, how many times should I forgive them and he he was being very very uh, as i would say liberal with forgiveness by even saying seven times according to the times of the day seven times was a lot and jesus says i I don't say to you seven times but 77 times and jesus is not literally giving a specific number so it's not as if you sit there and say i'm at 76 you better cut it out you got one more time tommy one more time and you are out the door But Jesus isn't giving a literal number. He's exasperating the the illustration that or even the answer and response that Peter is giving him. It's a hyperbole. Jesus is just, he's just exasperating it. To be clear again, Peter's really being generous with seven times. But Jesus says 77 times. Imagine someone robs you for one time, two times, three times, four times. And you're like, I, I'm, I can't keep letting you come in my house. How many times do I have to let you rob me and forgive you? And some of y'all are like, I would have been done after the second time. And y'all, 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 y'all not. Y'all hardcore. You do the old stuff. First time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. And Jesus is like 77 times. Jesus points to Peter, an extreme amount of forgiveness, and then dives into this parable in order to illustrate why, not what we should do, but why we should be that grace-filled towards others. I want to stop for a moment to recognize that the scripture we read does not mention the word grace at all. But everything in the text is grace in motion. Because nobody deserves forgiveness, but the master gave an abundant amount of forgiveness. In the midst of, and I'll point it out in a moment, in the midst of this man lying to his master. This parable is often called the unforgiving servant or the the merciless servant, the unmerciful servant. But this is truly a parable of hypocritical grace. Where a hypocrite who receives something refuses then to Give to others what he has received from the Lord. Jesus compares the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the inner workings of how forgiveness and mercy work and grace work to a king who is settling accounts with his servants. And he begins to illustrate to his audience to bring a deeper understanding of the why behind what Jesus has just told them. And he tells them a story of a king and two servants and this king of course this master he represents god and the two servants represent individuals the one with the great debt is you in case you're missing it the one with the big debt is every single one of us and in this story this servant owes this guy this master ten thousand talents 
Now, you might not know what a talent is. According to that day, a, a single talent was a year's worth of wages. Oof. This guy owes 10,000 talents. If we, and these are like, like, these measurements in the biblical times were in gold. Talents of gold, right? If you take that measurement today, you're looking at over $18 billion that this servant is indebted to this master. This is, Jesus is giving an extreme example. When he would, when the disciples would have heard 18, you know, 10,000 talents of gold, they would have been like, what? That's absurd. But in response to payment, what, is the, what does the guy do? He falls on his knees and he says, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. The, the result of what was going to happen, and this is very key to understand this, his wife and his children would all be sold. Now, while, while that is like, oh, my God, to your ears, back in those days, that was the price of debt. Can I tell you something? That Jesus isn't literally talking about debt. He's talking about sin. And the price of sin is still the wreckage of your family. It could break marriages apart. It could get to your children and mislead your children. It could be sold into bondage to the enemy. And you might not even recognize what the, what the issues of sin in your life are causing. And the servant falls on his face and he lies to his master. And he says, I'm going to pay you everything. It's impossible for this man to pay. Sometimes as we get before the Lord, I'm going to live for you. And we know we're lying. I will never turn away from you, God. And three days later. So this man goes before this master and he lies. And the master has already given this edict that you're, I'm going to sell your family. I'm, you don't even have enough to cover the debt, but I'm going to try to recoup what I can. And here's the spiritual principle, right? The debt is a metaphor for sin and our sin is a mega debt. It is massive. It's the weight that none of us can afford to pay. And here's the lesson, that we will never have enough to pay the debt of sin. Even if you sold your whole family, you would still fall short to pay this debt of sin. If you sold everything you own materially, you don't got enough to pay this debt of sin. So the servant pleads in mercy, and, and here's what he gets, right? He gets grace in return. He receives this from his master, Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave his debt. Here's where we see grace in motion. The master had pity or mercy on this man. Remember, a simple definition of mercy is this. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. But he gives him grace instead. The unmerited forgiveness or favor. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, whereas mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Mercy and grace differ in that way. But now the, the plot thickens as this guy has been forgiven of everything. He's left Sunday service. He gave his life to Christ. This boy is forgiven. Tell your neighbor, forgiven. forgiven. And he walks outside and he finds a guy who owes him a hundred denarii. Mind you, he just got forgiven $18 billion of debt. He finds a guy who owes him roughly 15 racks. That's Ebonics for $15,000. <laughs> this guy finds another brother who owes him $15,000. And his response is before he even talks to him, he yokes him up. Starts choking this brother, demanding that he pay him what he owed him. This church is ugly. This is like a novella. This is like, this is, this is bad stuff. This is Jerry Springer worthy. This is Maury all day. We look at this and we say, how could you, who have been forgiven of so much, turn around and not give grace and forgiveness 
to the person who owed you so little. And the other servants, they see this taking place because that guy, he is so adamant to be paid. He throws the man in jail. He had received so much grace, but he could not give the grace. A lot of believers, we love to be recipients of grace, but not dispensers of grace. Here's point number one, that the grace we've been given is the grace we should be giving. How can we live in grace, but not give grace? The core principle here is not just about forgiveness, but that those who are grace-filled should be grace-fueled. That our response to situations in life is going to be grace on the basis of that which we have received. That God who was rich in mercy, according to Ephesians, lavished us with mercy, coupled it with grace, and gave us what we did not deserve. Looking at this story through the lens of grace, it shows us that the grace that we have been given, the expectation of God is that we would give that said grace to others. And the first question I'll ask you this morning is, are you giving the grace you've been given? This is a radical concept for some, but yet how can we say we are in God's image? How can we call ourselves Christ-like? How can we call ourselves Christians when we harbor unforgiveness? We harbor bitterness in our heart towards individuals who have hurt us. And yet we don't want to forgive. We don't exemplify the grace we've been given. We just exasperate the grace that we've been given. Are you giving the grace that you have been given? Or are you the person who demands that others pay you what they owe you? Whether it's through an apology, whether it's through them coming to you and professing that they were wrong, whether it's them coming to you and telling you you were right, whatever the context is, before you think about anybody else, think about yourself, where have you not given grace where God has called you to give grace? Jesus tells us this parable, and here was the expectation of the master when that servant is brought back. He says, I forgave you so much, how could you not forgive this man? And here's what God is telling each and every one of us. You have been forgiven of all of your sins, and even the ones you are yet to commit, you have grace for. And you're telling God? That you can't look at those who've offended you and those who have hurt you and those who have done wrong to you and those who have brought pain into your life and those who have hurt you, whether emotionally or physically or or spiritually, you're saying you cannot give grace. And here's what God is saying, that nothing anybody does to you can amount to that which he has forgiven you of. Nothing anyone can do against you can amount to what you have been forgiven of. And so here's what God is saying to all of us today. How dare you? That is hypocrisy at the highest level that we can sing in church and worship in church and receive it but never give it. Are we Christian? Or are we just religious? Who has hurt you? Who's talked about you? Who's done wrong to you? Spoken evil of you. Can I walk up your street real quick? Have you forgiven your parents for all the stuff they've done to you? Have you forgiven mommy and daddy for all the wounds they've caused in your life? Or are you still a sum total of all that you have been through and you have yet to be able to release it, but you're walking in grace, in step with the Spirit? What is the good of being able to hear from the Lord prophetically, to have the best singing, to have the best pastoral gift, to be the best teacher of the word of God, to have all the best of everything in your life, but you cannot truly love those who birthed you because of the wounds they have placed on your life. And here God says to all of us, but I've forgiven you of so much. I can say this because I've been there, done that. My father was amazing, but my mother, she had, she had some health issues. She had some mental health issues. And I had to grow up and realize that mom didn't have everything she needed. And I had to, for a, a period of my life, 
I had to go visit her and forgive. Every time I've walked through those doors, I'm not going to treat you on the basis of how you treated me. I'm not going to treat you or love you on the basis of what you have done to me because you did the best with what you had. I can't judge you. You're my mother. You're my father. All I have is one, and so I have to honor you. And the Bible, as I've told you before, it says honor your parents. It doesn't say if they're good or bad. It just says honor them. It just says honor them. And it was painful, and it was, it was heart-wrenching. I never forget, I, 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 was at, um, I was at Walgreens on Barnum Avenue, and I was getting my mom's favorite candy because I was going to visit her. And Myla and Aria were in the, uh, the store with me, and um, I'm p- picking up my mom's favorite candy. She likes Ferrero Rocher's and Cadbury, and she's going to be with the Lord. But I, I was going to visit her, and Myla, she, she's very perceptive, and very, she always asks the right question. She says, hey why don't you visit your mom like every week? I was like, oh, this is when I was in my process. I was in my process of letting this stuff go. And I said, hey, I got to be honest with you because I'm never going to lie to you because you're my, you're my daughter. I said, mom wasn't always the best mom. And a lot of stuff as an adult I now realize wasn't normal. And I'm working through my pain. And I am trying to forgive my mom little by little. That was a mistake. I thought five-year-old Myla could handle that. She could not. The second mistake was I brought them upstairs with me. And we go into my mom's room. She's in her bed. She's, she was invalid. And, and uh, Myla takes off her coat. As God is my witness, she takes her coat off. And she slams it on my mom's bed. Why were you a terrible mother to my dad? I'm <laughs> just like, I don't know if that's what I wanted to do. Here comes Arya, who I can do no wrong in her eyes. Yeah, he told us all about it, which was not true. I told you the tip of the iceberg. And my mom's like, your dad's a liar. He would never lie to us about that. And my, I'm like having to referee my five and six-year-old with my mother. But in the end, I had to show them an example of true forgiveness and I had a great role model because my father he'd been through so many things in life but he forgave radically been hurt by many people he forgave radically what are you holding on to forgiveness and we say this all the time in church but it's just like it falls on deaf ears sometimes forgiveness doesn't make what someone's done to you okay it makes you okay (laughs) forgiveness Whether it's a molestation, a rape, whether it's a betrayal of trust, whether it's an ex-husband or an ex-wife, whether it's an old friend who backstabbed you, whether it's a parent who has hurt you or wounded you, it does not make them and their actions okay. Does it make it right? But it does make you right with God. And that's the difference maker, that because I want to be right with God, I have to make it right with others. Notice the actions of the graceless servant, the hypocrite. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. This idea of choking, it kind of, they can't breathe, they can't talk, can't worship, can't pray, because you're being choked. (laughs) Sometimes when you are living in a place of unforgiveness... You're choking the life out of others. When you're living in a place of unforgiveness, you're living in a place of bitterness, whether you realize it or not, you can choke the life out of your spouse. You can choke the life out of your kids. You can choke the life out of your friends. You can choke the life out of your relationships because you are one hurt person trying to rectify everybody's wrongs against you, not realizing that you're not called to rectify the wrongs. You are called to forgive them. And to allow God to be the judge. He chokes this servant. He seizes him. And he violently grabs him. The second servant was obviously a subordinate to him. Of some sort. But he begins to choke this man. Does this look like someone who just received grace? When you see the person that hurts you. And your stomach turns. And you begin to have the thoughts you shouldn't have. Do you look like somebody who's been forgiven of so much? Can we just talk about it for a moment? 
do you really look like what you are saying Christ has done for you? Well, we can agree on the fact that the answer is no to, the, to this question that we don't look like Christ, that we don't look like someone who's received mercy and forgiveness. How often are we that unmerciful, graceless, hypocritical servant? It might be more often than we want. We talk bad about those who hurt us and call it venting. It's really gossip. We gossip about people who have offended us. We harbor ill will. And here's why we, do, here's why we gossip. Because we want others to see people the way that we see the situation. Rather than just letting God be your defender. Rather than letting God be your guide. Hey, you know what? I, I, yeah, whatever you want to say, it's cool. I just, I'm not going to get into that. There's no edification in that. You hold grudges. You have people even in church you don't like. People at your job you don't like. And you use Christianese. Like, I just don't vibe with that person. That's not even Christian. That we get along based on a vibe. What's the vibe? Is it like little wiggly feelings that just connect when you like somebody special? Like, what is this vibe stuff you guys are talking about nowadays? And where do I find? Jesus never looks at it and says, hey, you know, blessed are those who find the vibe. Like, I just don't. It's just not there. But here's the thing. We govern our lives by feelings instead of being faithful. We talk. We have rivalries. You have rivalries among you. Silly stuff. Foolish stuff. We hold grudges against individuals that we deem to owe us something. We stand on a self-righteous giant white horse or platform trying to to, to get people to perceive a situation the way we do, not realizing that we're just so far from God and the image of God. And then here's the question that, that's at the base of that. But we've been recipients of grace? And have we learned nothing but how much God has forgiven us for? You see, when you have a sense of self-righteousness, it's this. It's that you are righteous in your perspective because of your actions. That's self-righteousness. That not only has God given you grace, but now you have done such a good job at maintaining your, your perfection levels. That then you look at everybody else and you look down on them and God says, no, 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 that's not how that works. Here's point number two. That when our actions don't contain grace, we live in jeopardy of vain grace. Listen to this extremely humbling verse from Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul was talking to this church in Corinth, and they were claiming to have received the fullness of grace, yet they were living in sin, not correcting one another, not holding one each other accountable, and they were doing all types of wicked and wild stuff, and their lives were a mess, and Paul's like, that's vain grace. You say that you have received it, but you are not walking like somebody who has received it. To receive grace in vain means to live a superficial Christian existence that does not model what Christ has done for you or for me. Vain grace is when we claim to be saved and forgiven by grace, but we don't display grace to others. How can we, who have been forgiven of so much, not release those who have offended us in small ways? And then I know what we say. Some people are saying, well, it's not just, it wasn't a one-time thing. It was so many times. That, and we have a list. And then I will bring your attention to 1 Corinthians 13, where it says that love keeps no record of wrongdoing. And that as believers, we should not have a laundry list of ways the person has offended us. As a matter of fact, the next time I offend you, it should be the first time, even if it's the 20th time. Because true Christianity says, because I've kept no record of wrong." Like God, who throws our sins, Isaiah, into the sea of forgetfulness, read your Bibles, it's there, that it means that you and me, your spouse, your family, your relationships at work, when someone offends you and you forgive them, the next time is the first time. But because the next time for you is the next time, we begin to operate outside of grace. And Jesus is like, no, 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 there should be radical grace for you and others, you might hear that and think, well, pastor, you don't understand. I've been really hurt as if others have not. Someone really offended me. They really betrayed me. Here's, the, here's what Jesus is saying. In comparison to all that you've been forgiven of, not that it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter. 
because there's no comparison. That's what Jesus is saying. These two things are not even on the same spectrum. It doesn't matter what they have done to you. It doesn't matter how many times they have done it. The entirety of your sin has been forgiven because of grace. So how much then should we dispense even small amounts of grace? Are you giving the grace that you've been given? Or are you in jeopardy of living in what Paul would call vain grace? Far too often we hold on to hurts. We don't forgive. We have people that we dislike, that we hate, that we talk opposite of, that we, we sit there and chatter about, we text about, we screenshot their Facebook post, we screenshot their Instagram, and we send it to our friends, and we just put, hmm, or we put the eye emojis, and we sit there gossiping, and we're sitting there acting unchristlike, and we're in this competition in our own mind. We use all these Christianese sayings. To explain it away, but the truth is this, that we are not giving the grace that we're called to give. Here's here's the, the truth. It's a tough truth. That is hypocrisy to the fullest degree. And that if that's you in any way, shape, or form, that you need to repent. And I know someone just said, but I did forgive. I did, I did, I did, I did. But when I see them, I still want to kill them. You, you need to ask the Lord for a greater sense of forgiveness. Maybe you forgave him as a child does. You gave him kid forgiveness. You know what kid forgiveness is, right? When you do something bad as a kid and then your parents make you go say sorry to the other kid. And you're just like, sorry. And then your parents are like, say it like you mean it. It's like, I don't. Like, say it right. Sorry. But you're not sorry. At all. And then the other parents are like, well, tell them you forgive them, but you don't at all. Because they gave you a black eye in front of the whole class, and now you're mad. And you have to say, I forgive you, because that's what the parent told you to say. You know it's the right thing to do, but the heart. What did Jesus say at the end? You don't forgive from your heart. Some of you have forgiven from the head, but not from the heart. There's a mental idea of it, but in the heart, it's different. We love to receive grace. We embrace grace for ourselves, but we don't want to give grace. Let's recap as I close with this. The grace you've been given is the grace you should be giving. If you, God has done a work of grace in your life, then you should be willing to give grace. And then secondly, when our actions don't contain grace, we're in jeopardy of living in what Paul would call vain grace. The scripture calls us to not just receive grace, but to dispense grace. At this point in this type of sermon about grace or mercy or forgiveness, you may be asking yourself, but how do I actually forgive because I'm really, really hurt? Well, listen to what the master says in verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt that you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. What did the master reflect on? The master reflected on his own goodness towards his servant. Hear this now. If the master is represent, representative of God and God is rehearsing his own goodness to his servant and saying to his servant, this alone should have brought you to the place of forgiveness. This alone. He points out two things. The immensity of his debt. And secondly, the depths of his grace. I forgave you of so much. Do you see it there? Here's the key to true forgiveness. We begin to rehearse and remember that which we have been forgiven for. And what begins to happen is when we begin to really focus on all that we, if you sat there and looked at all the bad things you have done, all the wrong things you have said, 
All the times you've hurt people, all the stuff you watched you shouldn't have watched, all the times you were engaged in sexual immorality, all the things that you have brought into this world that are sin-fueled and sin-filled, all of that, when you begin to really remember, because sometimes you can praise God for what he's done for you, but if you don't remember all of it, then you won't begin to want to forgive somebody else. So here's what the master says. It's when you want to really forgive somebody something that to you seems big, what you should do is remember what I did for you. And if you can begin to sit there and remember that, what will begin to happen is that what has been done to you will begin to shrink down. And you recognize the word, a phrase that some of us don't like to hear. It ain't that deep. In comparison to what I have forgiven you, this isn't that hard. This isn't that big. Here's point number three before some of y'all start emailing me. (laughs) Apparently, I forgot to give point three in Easter. I gave it, but I didn't say here's point three. So it's my fault. I had Quan and Jason Ayala texting. Quan cornered me. You didn't get point three. Whoa, chill, bro. A couple of y'all just came after my heart. Whoa. Here's point number three, Quan. The key to giving grace is rehearsing the grace you've been given. If you begin to remember, remember all of this is Peter asking a question. When somebody hurts me, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus is giving this story. He gives out this story of immense grace and forgiveness and why. Here's what Jesus is telling Peter. Peter, I'm getting ready to forgive you for everything you've ever done. Don't tell me you can't forgive some people for some things they've done to you. That's what he's saying. You see, every so often I have a moment where I reflect on the grace of God in my life and I get humbled by this grace. The grace for my sins, the grace for my wrongdoings, the grace that Christ displayed on the cross, the grace through all the mix-ups, the grace through all the mess-ups, the grace that he gives me in my immature leadership, the grace he's given me in my younger years, the grace when I fall short as a husband, when I fall short as a dad, when I fall short as a friend, he gives me grace. When I fall short as a brother to my siblings, when I fall short in any area of my life, which is pretty easy for me because I'm short, God's like, you know what, there is grace for you you but in light of all of that grace I say to myself how can I not forgive you of what you've done to me giving others the grace that God has given us does it make anything they've done okay but it does make my heart right with God and in this parable the graceless servant here's what happens to him he loses his grace He fell short. He was put into a place of torment. And the words of Jesus are tough to hear. He says, my heavenly father would do this to you all if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. And you might say, pastor, is this about forgiveness or grace? And I would say to you that true forgiveness takes grace. You cannot truly forgive without grace itself. The words of Christ is that when we don't forgive from the heart, we enter into a place of torment. And let me tell you something. Some of you are living in a place of torment. Certain names can't be mentioned around you without your eyes rolling, without your gut clenching, without the butterflies coming. We enter into this place of mental torment, asking the same questions. Well, why would my uncle or my aunt or my mother or my father or why would this person I don't understand and why why and we swim out into the what ifs of life never getting a resolution rather than saying what has God done for me that gives me the strength to release this debt who do you need to forgive to extend grace to that God is calling on your life to do The greatest debt-free plan is salvation. Where you can, number one, get saved and free from all your debts. But you can also be called to release those who have debt to you. Come on, would you stand with me this morning as the prayer team makes their way up quickly, quickly, quickly. We're so grateful this morning for the presence of God in our worship time. Amen. And we're grateful this morning that God 
is doing a work in your heart and in your life. And for some of you, you might need to deal with some of the unforgiveness in your heart. I want to say to you that we've been praying for you. I'm praying this morning for each and every one of you all. If you're watching online, there's people standing by to pray with you. But we want to pray with you. You may never get the answer you're looking for. As to why someone has done what they've done to you. But you can release them through forgiveness. And here's something else. That same person might continue to hurt you. But when you walk in grace, it doesn't hit the same. Because you're walking in the truth of God's word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a moment here, we're going we're gonna to ask people to come forward for prayer. Maybe there's some folks that you want to forgive, that you need strength, you need prayer. If you're here today and you're not walking with Christ and you're, you're like, hey, pastor, I need God to give me that first grace. The first work of grace where I turn my life over to him. Can I tell you, that's the best decision you could ever make. If you're in this room or online watching and you want to give your life to Christ, I want to encourage you to lift your hand as high as you can right now. You're saying, Pastor, I want to submit my life to Christ. One, two, and three. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. I don't want to walk in the same way that I've been walking, but I want to trust the Lord. I need some forgiveness myself. Thank you. Okay, two people raised their hands. Would you give God praise for that? Would you give God praise for that? In just a moment, I'm going to ask you if you raised your hand. And that's a big step. I'm going to ask you to take a public step and come forward. And here's why we do this. Because there should be an outward expression of what's inwardly happening. And it's a step of faith. And we, I'm telling you, we've been praying for you. Maybe you're scared to come by yourself. Ask somebody next to you to come with you. Amen. If you raise your hand, would you do me a favor? Would you come up now? No shame in your game today. Come on. Amen. That's right. That's right. You know you need Christ in your life. You want to reconcile and make your heart right with the Lord. Today's the day of salvation. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a moment of prayer here, a time of prayer. Because the truth of the matter is that some of us, we may know Jesus, but we need some serious grace to forgive us for not forgiving others. We're going to pray. We're going to worship in just a moment here. But if you need prayer for that area of your life, I want you to come down this center aisle. If you got some unforgiveness lingering in your heart, some wounds still open, maybe some mother issues, some father issues, and there's some pain in your heart on the basis of what someone has done against you, and you found it hard to let it go, I want to encourage you, today is your day. Amen? Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your heart and for your ministry in this room, for the ministry of the Spirit of God. I thank you today you're going to be healing hearts and opening spiritual eyes. Lord, help us to take an inventory right now if there's any area of our life that is not aligned with you in the area of forgiveness and grace, that you would come now and reveal it to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, the church say amen. Come on, if that's you, come down this center aisle. We would love to pray with you this morning.